things. I hope you guys have a good break. Now I have the honor. Well, my name is Tavia. I'm currently the external events director at CSSA, and I'm in charge of all speaker things. But right now I have the honor to introduce Professor Joshua Lee. He's a associate professor in the Department of Philosophy, and he studies the philosophy of sound mind, metaphysics, and the foundation of cognitive science and neuroscience. He does a lot of work around the mind-body problems, the consciousness and how the deep conscious emerged from the brain. Today he'll be giving us a talk titled, The Role of Philosophy and Science in Understanding Our Conscious Awareness. So now I give you Professor Joshi. All right, thank you so much. Well, first of all, thank you so much for, uh, uh, to the organizers for inviting me to be here today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I guess I'm a little bit of an odd one out in the talk as the speakers today because um, I'm a philosopher. Um, I'm not actually a scientist. So I don't run a lab or anything like that. Rather, um, my main engagement with uh, science of the mind um, has to do with uh, thinking sort of theoretically and philosophically about the nature of the kind of theories that uh, people propose in cognitive science. Um, and in particular, um, uh, one of the main areas that I work on um, is uh, theories of consciousness. And um, we live in kind of an exciting era for people who are interested in conscious awareness. Um, so back in the day, not too recently, um, maybe like um, not too long ago, I mean, uh, maybe, you know, as recently as the 1990s, the topic of conscious awareness was considered a little bit um, disreputable within um, cognitive science. Uh, it's really more regarded as the kind of thing that one might have late night campfire discussions about, or um, maybe um, discussions within philosophy classrooms. <laughs> but these days, um, there are, uh, you know, there's a whole uh, flourishing science of consciousness, um, and people put forward, uh, you know, theories that get um, published in uh, respectable journals, people get large grants to study the topic, and so on and so forth. Um, but that does. All of this work does raise the question of what kind of things should count as a serious scientific theory of consciousness that um, is worth, worth actually paying attention to. Um, and uh, what I wanted to talk to you about today is an idea about this that um, I think is extremely common among people working on the science of consciousness, um, but which I think um, in some ways encodes a kind of misunderstanding about what it will actually take in the end to understand consciousness. Um, and what I'm going to emphasize is that really in the end of the day, there's a kind of um, empirical scientific component to this enterprise and also a kind of philosophical theoretical component to it, and we need both of these in play. Um, so the argument I'm going to look at goes like something like this, that scientific theories that are serious candidates for acceptance have to generate empirical predictions that allow them to be tested. Um, theories that weren't taken seriously should be scientific theories that meet this standard. Um, and therefore, serious theories of consciousness to generate empirical predictions. Um, and if you look at the kind of theories that people are discussing these days, um, there's an obvious sense in which they look like serious scientific theories in that they actually make proposals, for example, about which areas of the brain are involved in conscious awareness. So one of the sort of iconic debates happening right now um, is between theories that propose that um, conscious awareness can be realized entirely within perceptual systems. So for example, you've got the, um, the ventral stream. Um, and according to some theories like recurrent processing theories, um, just activity within the ventral stream would be sufficient for you to have a subjective conscious experience. Whereas, um, some theories, so-called cognitive theories, for example, the global workspace theory, propose that we only have conscious awareness when um, perceptual areas in the back of the brain um, talk to cognitive areas in the front of the brain, like the prefrontal cortex. Um, and so consciousness requires much more kind of widespread activity and uh, a much wider range of brain areas kind of communicating with each other. Um, so, um, that gives you the flavor of the kind of science of consciousness going on right now. Um, now, one idea about consciousness that's been getting a lot of press attention recently, recently um, and also has become, has become a site of much controversy, um, is an idea about consciousness called panpsychism that has been proposed by some philosophers. So, um, probably the most recent notable 
proponent of this is Philip Yorke. Um, and uh, this is the idea that in some sense there is conscious awareness everywhere in the universe. Um, a little bit more precisely, the idea is that if you look at the basic physical components proposed in our best theory of fundamental physics, so that you can like quarks or strings um, or fields, um, then whatever these basic components are, they have a primitive form of conscious experience. Um, and moreover, that primitive kind of experience in some way is going to contribute to the explanation of the kind of macroscopic experiences that are associated with systems like the human brain. Now, um, the fact that this has got a lot of attention has annoyed a lot of people who are trying to promote a kind of serious science of consciousness. Um, because it, can, it seems like, like intuitively like sort of this flavor of more of a wildly speculative philosophical idea rather than a kind of empirically testable theory. Um, and the complaint that is normally made about it is precisely that it's not testable. So here's a Neil Seth in 2018. He says, this leads us to the main problem with panpsychism. It's not that it sounds crazy. It's that it can't be tested. It doesn't lead to any feasible program of experimentation. Progress in scientific understanding requires experiments and testability. So what I wanted to do today with this talk is basically to push back a little bit on that kind of critique. Um, I think I'm not a fan of panpsychism, and I don't really take it all that seriously. But I think that the kind of criticism that's received is wrong. Um, I don't think it's true that all aspects of our theories of consciousness ought to be empirically testable in that way. And I don't think that that is a fair criticism of panpsychism. Um, and in fact, I think that all um, theories of consciousness in the end are going to contain elements that are a bit like the kind of thing that panpsychism is trying to do. Um, So that's what I, um, I'm going to be trying to argue for. Now, um, um, before we get to any of that, I just want to back up and uh, sort of fill out a little bit of background here. So I've already been dropping in this term consciousness into the talk, but what exactly does that mean? Um, one of the important things that we need to do in this debate is just a little bit of ground clearing at the beginning to get some sense um, of what this term can refer to. Um, and importantly, uh, most people in this debate really are, when they use this word consciousness, what they're really interested in is something like sensory experience, in the sense of just the having of experiences that feel a certain way to the subject. Um, the philosopher Thomas Nagel is well known for elucidating this in terms of this phrase, there being something it's like for a subject. Um, so if you compare um, you know, something like a rock or maybe something like um, a bacterium with a human being, an obvious difference is that there actually is something like a subjective perspective associated with um, the um, person. Uh, and one can puzzle about whether uh, something like subjective experience is found in certain cases. If you look at um, the noble octopus, um, octopi are you know, mollusks, and so they've evolved on quite a separate part of the um, tree of life from human beings. So it seems to be fair game to one, even though they're quite smart, it seems to be fair game to wonder whether they really are sentient beings. Um, for example, can they feel pain? Um, and when we're wondering about that, um, it's important to emphasize that um, we don't mean consciousness in the sense of something like self-awareness, which is another legitimate use of the word consciousness, um, like self-consciousness. Um, one, for example, one could reasonably and coherently ask, does an, an octopus feel pain, even if one, one was quite confident that the octopus couldn't actually have thoughts about its own mind or, or thoughts about itself. Um, we're just talking about whether it has sentience in a much more simple sense. Um, similarly, you know, if you could look at um, a sophisticated AI system, um, like maybe a robot that may exist at some point <laughs> in the future, and ask whether it has conscious experience in a sense. Um, and we don't mean here whether it's intelligent, we don't mean whether it's having thoughts about itself, we just mean is there something it's like to be this system, like does it have any experiences. Um, and the point is that um, even if you know a lot about how it functions, um, arguably it's still conceivable that it's just a kind of insentient machine, um, and similarly with the octopus. Okay, so that's just what we mean by consciousness. Um, 
Um, and then one can ask, well, uh, what, would, what would it take for there to be a science of consciousness? Um, and the first thing to say is that, you know, the big background assumption here that everyone has is that there's some kind of systematic connection between physical or structural features of the brain, or, or maybe some larger system like the brain core, um, and features of conscious experience. And that we could, in principle, um, you know, measure people's experiences. Um, uh, although, that, although it's a very difficult issue, how exactly one does that. And then um, find out what these systematic connections are. Um, and the most popular view about why there would be such systematic connections is a, a view that we can call reductionism. Um, which is a flavor of physicalism, which is just the idea that ultimately we're just these physical systems and nothing else. Um, and it says that, uh, you know, conscious awareness just is a special kind of complex processing in the brain. So the task is just to say what that is. Now, um, it's important to note that actually some people who are card carrying physicalists um, think that that kind of reductionist proposal is a little bit strong and that all we really really need for the science of consciousness is a thing called supervenience, which basically just says that um, whatever consciousness awareness is, it's fully determined by the brain. So that it, you can't change what's going on in someone's, say, visual field without changing what's going on in their brain. Um, and all you would need uh, for that is something like psychophysical laws, that is principles that link together conscious states with states of the brain. So then the task is to figure out what those laws are. Um, and that leads to this project, which is known as uh, the search for the neural correlates of consciousness. And that asks, uh, what are the neural bases in humans, um, both in particular kinds of conscious experience? So for example, you might be interested in color experience, um, and uh, you might want to look at different patterns in neural activity in say uh, the visual system, like an area of your form, um, and figure out which ones, say just have greenish experiences rather than reddish experiences and so on. Um, but there's also just a general question of what's the neural difference between um, having conscious awareness in the first place and uh, having complete, complete lack of conscious awareness. So, for example, you can look at the effects of uh, general anesthetics on the brain uh, and see what exactly uh, the um, brain systems are that are intervened with and prevent conscious awareness. So, um, there's been a whole bunch of paradigms that have been um, developed to study these types of correlations um, in a systematic way. Um, and perhaps the most famous one is um, the idea of uh, binocular rivalry. So um, the phenomenon of binocular rivalry, in case you're not familiar with it, um, is that um, if we feed um, signals into the visual system um, uh, through the left and the right eyes, um, they involve completely different visual information. So for example, um, if you view this um, image through red and green glasses, you get a picture of a house fed into your left eye and a picture of a um, face fed in, uh, into your right eye. Um, so you might wonder, well, what would happen if you did that? And uh, you know, one guess you might have is that you just get a strange kind of weird mashed up experience, which is a bit face-ish and a bit house-ish. Um, but that's um, actually not what happens. Um, the sort of uh, well-known result here is that we actually end up with a kind of oscillating visual experience, uh, whereby at one moment you're seeing a, um, uh, a face and then that fades out and then you're seeing a house. And, um, People interested in the neural basis of conscious awareness picked up on this um, quite quickly because um, it seems to provide a promising way to study what exactly the brain areas are that are critically involved in these different experiences. Um, and in particular, um, you know, what you see if you uh, put someone in an fMRI machine and look at what's going on in their brain um, during binocular rivalry is that in early areas of visual processing, like in V1, um, you just have the signals from both of these images going on the whole time being processed. Um, and it's only when you look uh, like deeper in visual processing, um, in particular, you look in areas that are um, um, in the ventral stream, like in the infratemporal cortex, um, you'll see um, uh, 
changes in activity that correlate with these changes in, in experience. So here um, um, in this study by Tom and Kanwisher, they found that when subjects are seeing the face, um, this area of the feast form face area is lighting up. Um, and when they're seeing the house, this area of the parahippocampal place area is lighting up. So the obvious thing to infer is that these are critical areas for conscious awareness. Um, now, um, you know, it's not that uh, people conclude from this that if you were to be able to take, for example, the parahippocampal campal place area and sort of um, remove that from the brain and keep it alive and have exactly that pattern of neural activity just on its own outside of the context that it's in, that that would involve an experience. Um, it's more like that's the difference maker for what kind of experience you're having right now, but only will create experience in a certain kind of um, context, maybe involving um, connections with other areas of the brain. And that's also what we're really interested in. Um, so, um, so people have been engaging in um, this type, type of projects. I'm not going to have time here today to like show you a whole bunch of these different paradigms that people have been looking at, but we have more and more sophisticated, um, as you may know, we have more and more sophisticated ways of um, probing what's going on in the brain and coming up with cor correlations between that and experience. So, um, so these days there's more sophisticated fMRI te techniques, for example, involving uh, looking at um, voxel patterns and being able to do something approved forms of mind reading, whereby one um, can make predictions about what people are seeing or imagining based on um, information that we have about uh, patterns in neural activity. So um, I think it's, uh, Fruitful and interesting to think about what the sort of ideal endpoint is of uh, this kind of research from the point of view of studying conscious awareness. Uh, where exactly is all this heading? Um, and I take it that the kind of the sort of fantasy endpoint here um, is what we might call a, a general correlation theory. Um, and that's a theory such that given a, um, a physical description of the brain or some other kind of physical system, it's a theory that enables us to tell whether or not the system is a conscious system. And also gives a complete description of the content or qualitative character of an experience that experience is occurring. Um, and um, one might also want that the other way around. One might, might want to be able to predict what's going on in the brain given knowledge of experience. Um, now, um, there's a whole bunch of things about this that I think are uh, potentially a little bit um, theoretically problematic. So for example, there's the idea here that you could completely describe someone's experience. Um, and that raises the question, well, you know, what would the vocabulary be that we would use for that? Um, what exactly would a, a description of experience of this kind look like? Um, I think those are all really good questions that we don't necessarily have perfect answers to right now. Um, let's put it mildly. Um, but the issue that I'm going to be uh, focusing on in this talk um, has to do more with um, uh, whether a theory of this kind that in effect sets up systematic correlation between neural activity and descriptions of experience, whether that would be in its own right a kind of complete endpoint to um, our project of understanding conscious awareness. And um, the point I think, um, certainly most of the philosophers working in this area would agree with, and I, I would hope um, a lot of the scientists as well, is that we can't really accept that as just the end point, even though it would be a magnific magnificent ach achievement, um, because presumably we want to know why these correlations hold. We want to explain the correlations and not just state what the correlations are. Okay. Um, and um, in general here, um, I think it's really important to bear in mind that uh, there's going to be two parts of this whole project. Um, there's what I call the reverse engineering problem, um, which is just the problem that most people in cognitive science and neuroscience are just working on at an everyday level, um, which is just the, the question of what the, object, what the correct description is of the objective physical structure of the brain and the body. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in perception or visual, say, visual perception, then you want to know how exactly it is that um, 
visual system manages to extract something like a representation of um, the external environment from um, incoming data coming in on the rest of um, And we do that by unpacking the kind of processes that occur in intermediate steps um, in the visual system. Um, the important point here, and this is the point that I think maybe is a little bit missed sometimes with people working in this area, is that um, if you're interested in um, something like conscious experience, or indeed other aspects of the mind that we just talk about in everyday life, uh, like our desires or intentions and so on, um, the so called um, properties of the mind that um, are the subject matter of what's called folk psychology, just our ordinary everyday way of making sense of our own minds. Um, then um, it's not enough just to complete the rest reverse engineering problem. We also have this thing called the mapping problem, which is just the problem of how do these phenomena map onto the objective physical structures um, as described by our best scientific way. And why is it that they map that way? And the way I would think about this is that that, that further mapping problem really involves two several problems. First of all, a kind of correlation problem, just what are the, the, cor the correlations between these physical facts and say facts about conscious experience? And secondly, an explanatory problem. Um, why is it that those are the correlations that we observe? Now, um, here's one of the sort of key points that I wanna make in this uh, talk um, that I see arising quite a bit uh, in contemporary discussions of consciousness. It is important to understand you can have two theorists who actually completely agree about um, the re reverse engineering problem. They might have the same picture, for example, about how visual processing works, but that doesn't mean they can't disagree about how consciousness maps onto all of that. Um, and uh, if you're in that kind of situation, which I'll illustrate in a second, um, then you can ask, well, you know, if they're proposing these different theories about consciousness maps onto all of that, will they make different empirical predictions? Um, and it, it doesn't take much thought to see that, well, of course, they won't make different empirical predictions in the sense of um, making different predictions about what you'll see going on in the brain or, or about how people will behave, the kind of thing that one can test in the lab. Um, because the whole point is that they agree about the objective functioning of the brain. If they agree about that, then their theories will make exactly the same predictions about what's going on in the brain and behavior and so on. Um, instead, what they're disagreeing about is this, this further mapping question. Um, and since it's kind of obvious that we're going to have to uh, answer this, we're going to have to give something like a mapping theory. This means that we cannot require that all differences between theories generate empirical predictions that can then um, be tested. Um, and there's actually an important example of this kind of phenomenon um, going on right now with um, different theories of consciousness that uh, uh, disagree about the areas of the brain involved in conscious awareness. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, some people have these kind of back of the brain theories where just perceptual processing, um, most stereotypically ventral stream perceptual processing um, is involved in conscious experience. And other people think that, um, no, 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 we need areas in the front of the brain as well. Now, um, one kind of controversy of this kind involves parties who agree about the kinds of um, perceptual processing that are relevant in the debate. In particular, they agree that there's certain kinds of perceptual processing that uh, definitely involve only uh, subliminal unconscious awareness. Um, so, for example, we can study um, types of subliminal perception um, that may go surprisingly deep into visual processing um, and uh, as a result give us priming effects. That is, we've got information being processed perceptually that can have some kind of effect on people's judgments and behavior, even though it doesn't involve conscious awareness. Um, so for example, Stan Behine uh, was well known for arguing that we can even have semantic priming, which is uh, processing of the meanings of words that is unconscious, but affects people's judgments and behavior. Um, 
So everyone agrees that that can happen uh, without any conscious awareness. Everyone agrees that there's these paradigm cases of experience where um, um, you've got this widespread activity where information is being broadcast across the brain and being used by um, cognitive systems. For example, cognitive systems involved in verbal report. So if, if you're very clearly sensing something in the middle of your visual field, um, like the color of an object, and you can just very clearly report it, say, oh, yes, there's a blue thing in front of me. Then everyone agrees about the kind of um, brain activity that we would expect to see there, and everyone agrees that it really involves consciousness. But um, there's another kind of case where um, you have this quite well-developed kind of uh, uh, activity um, in perceptual processing, where you've got a kind of amplification of a signal that's been sort of selected for further processing and is in a, in a kind of short-term perceptual buffer. Well, some people think that that is a genuine conscious experience. It might not be one that is like paradigmatic and attended to and is being primarily used and reported and used cognitively, but it's still there in some sense in your uh, field of awareness. Whereas other theorists, um, for example, Stan DeHeim will say, no, 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 that's just pre-conscious. That's just in this, that's this kind of processing that um, could easily lead to conscious awareness, but it's not uh, consciousness. Um, so the point here is just that um, what they're disagreeing about is how consciousness maps onto the underlying physical facts. And as a result, one would not expect that disagreement to lead necessarily to different empirical predictions. Um, but you might say, well, you might complain uh, against this. Look, don't theories of quotes, theories of consciousness, at least sometimes generate empirically testable predictions? My own response to that is, yes, of course, they do. Um, but that's because they make claims about uh, the reverse engineering problem as well as the mapping problem. Um, in particular, um, one thing that uh, people working on the science of consciousness often do is make claims about the neural implementation of so-called functional signatures of consciousness. So these are just capacities that one has that tend to go along, at least paradigmatically, with having conscious experience, for example, being able to confidently report that you have your experience. Um, and one thing people have done in this, in this area is come up with speculative theories, oh, sorry, not speculative, they just come up with uh, theories that can be tested about um, what underlies these types of functional signatures. So a famous example might be Crick and Cox's um, 1990 temporal binding theory that kind of kicked off the whole science of consciousness, where they um, proposed that um, underlying our experiences is an intentional process that selects information and is also involved in um, binding features together as features of a single object, um, and which also involves a, um, a certain um, signature of the neural level, namely um, gamma range um, synchronized neural firing. Um, and that generated empirically testable predictions because uh, on their theory, um, someone is only going to be able to report having an experience if these different factors were in play, namely attention, binding, and gamma range neural activity. Um, and it just turns out to be empirically false that all of those things necessarily are correlated when people can report um, what's going on in their environment. So for example, um, one can have unbound features that are, can be attended to and reported. So, for example, you can um, experience motion in peripheral vision without that motion being bound onto some, um, some kind of uh, visual or auditory object. Um, um, so, in, in that sense, um, they said some things that were empirically testable. Nonetheless, the, the point is that there's always this further mapping issue. Um, and how we decide uh, that part of it, I don't think is a, uh, an empirical uh, issue in the same sense. Okay, now just to develop this point a little bit, I did want to talk a little bit about this idea of a third problem, which is a famous idea about uh, consciousness. Um, it's an allegation that there's a sort, of, a sort of fundamental limitation to our ability to understand consciousness in scientific terms. Um, and the problem is one that goes back to philosophical discussions coming out of the 60s and 70s from people like Tom Nagel and uh, Frank Jackson, and it was given the name the hard problem by David Chalmers in the 1990s. Um, and the idea just is 
basically that it, once you've got correlations between experiences and brain states, there's always going to be this legitimate further worry about why those correlations occur. Um, um, in particular, it seems like you could imagine the brain state occurring just in the absence of a particular kind of experience. Um, so why is there experience at all there in the first place? Um, that's supposed to be puzzling and to be the kind of question that cannot be answered just by doing ordinary scientific reasoning. Um, and the way that Nagel tried to dramatize this with his, is with his famous example of bat echolocation, where the idea was that one could be a scientist who fully understands exactly how bat echolocation works at the neural level, um, but have no idea what it feels like from the bat's point of view when the bat um, has echolocation experiences. And indeed, one could wonder, um, well, why is it that the bat is a conscious being at all? And just merely, the idea was that just merely unpacking all of the neural processing won't answer the such questions about why you then get subjective experience. Um, at best, you're just going to understand correlations. Um, now, there's a lot of misunderstanding around, um, even among people who spent years working in this area, um, about what exactly this part problem is supposed to be. Um, and I think some of this misunderstanding is legitimate because it is genuinely the only um, why there's a, this, a, supposed to be this very difficult problem here uh, and what it is. Um, now, um, it, it's important that it's not just the observation that um, correlations need further explanation. Um, it's the claim that there's something especially difficult in the case of consciousness about providing those types of additional explanations. Um, and one way to see why it's not just about that further explanatory issue is that that further explanatory issue actually just arises in very many cases where we have a kind of familiar macroscopic phenomenon that we just talk about in everyday life and we want to give a scientific account of what it really is. So one example the philosophers love to go on about is water. Um, so, um, you know, we have the, the science of water that has revealed that... Uh, in fact, water just consists in H2O molecules. Um, from the present perspective, it's important to note that, in a way, the way that this science goes is with these two steps. So, first of all, what we found was these correlations basically figured out that whenever there was water around, like in clouds and puddles and so on, um, also there is H2O molecules present. Um, that's just a correlation, but then the, the obvious explanation for the correlation is just that the water just is H2O molecules. That's why you always find that these things going all together. So, um, so then the mapping part of it is really quite sort of trivial and easy, and maybe that's why we don't notice it. Um, another example might be lightning. So um, we found these correlations between the presence of lightning, like in a storm, and the presence of um, discharges of electrical potential between the ground and clouds. Um, why does why are these things correlated? Well, the obvious explanation is just that lightning just is <laughs> the electrical discharge. Um, so there again, there is this further mapping problem, but it ends up being fairly trivial. Um, now, um, people who are enthusiasts about this idea that there's a special hard problem here, um, what they the what they like to say, at least in part, is that um, the big difference with consciousness is that the mapping problem um, is not trivial. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that was all distracting. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Um, they'll say that uh, even for something like life, which is the, a famous example where we have this macroscopic phenomenon that people for centuries found extremely puzzling, um, people thought that you'd need a fundamentally different kind of science to explain life, but in the end of the day, we just found out that no, like living beings are just physical machines that um, have various capacities that are just explained in an ordinary physical way with the same principles that explain things like rocks and planets and so on. Um, um, even in that case, the idea is that once you understand all the physical mechanisms, in effect, once you've done the reverse engineering problem, then you can just see in a fairly easy way why you get the macroscopic phenomenon. Um, but allegedly for consciousness, it's not like that. We've like set up these correlations and it's not so trivial to see how you sort out this mapping problem. Um, 
So then that raises the question, well, not non-trivial in what sense? And I think that's where things get um, uh, a little bit tricky. So uh, my own view of this is that the answer to that question that we've been delivered by um, some of the philosophers who work in this area, so for example, David Chalmers, uh, who's associated with the, the hard problem, is a good example here. Um, I actually don't think his answer to that question is very satisfactory. Um, so I'm skeptical about whether there is, a, there is a hard problem in the sense that people are hence as there are, but I am sympathetic to the idea that there's this highly non-trivial mathematical problem. So we could call that the weak hard problem. Um, so now um, um, let's go back to panpsychism. So why is it that it's wrong to complain that panpsychism is bad because it doesn't make empirical predictions? Well, what exactly are these pan psychists going on about? Well, I'm not going to have time to really get too much into this, but roughly here's their idea. That um, if we look at mathematical models of the fundamental physical world, all that we're going to get from them is something like abstract structure. Um, like we'll get dynamical equations, but they'll just tell us how the world is abstractly structured. Um, and then they make this observation that if you consider your conscious experience, um, there's more to it than just abstract structure. Like if I told you the abstract structure of say a color experiences like the mental color solid, um, I haven't told you like the nature of the experiences that fill in that structure. I've just told you something very abstract about it. Um, so they, what they say is, well, if then that means that if you want to explain conscious experience, including like the features of experience that sort of fill in the structure, um, you're going to need more than the kind of description of, at the physical level that we can be um, that can be delivered by um, abstract mathematical equations. What you would need is something like insight into the intrinsic physical hardware that is described by those equations. Um, and all that actually I think is fairly reasonable. But then the key move they make is that uh, it's only if um, the sort of the, it's only if the nature of that sort of hidden physical hardware uh, at the fundamental level involves something subjective or proto-subjective that it could ex explain the kind of experiences that we have. So it's like they've got a kind of no experience in, no experience out sort of explanatory principle that they're agreeing to. Um, now, I don't personally think that that's very plausible. <laughs> I don't think we need anything like that. So I do think, I would agree that panpsychism is a bit crazy. I'm um, overblown. But the point here is that it, as a theory, it's, it is being proposed as a contribution to what I was calling the mapping problem, not as a theory that generates empirically testable consequences. Um, and in particular, it's purely a contribution to the explanatory part of the mapping problem. Um, it's not trying to um, uh, do the correlation part. Um, that is, it's not trying to tell you uh, in macroscopic terms which kinds of states of the human brain, for example, would give you conscious experiences. Um, it's totally compatible with all the different theories about, you know, whatever, like the global neuro, neuro workspace theory or integrated information theory or what have you. Um, it's saying that you, it's saying that those theories on their own won't do all the explanatory work. Um, and in particular, it's making this weird claim that you need to sort of inject consciousness from the bottom <laughs> to get it at the top, as it were. Um, now, um, the point is that uh, Everyone, including all the people that are putting forward these scientific theories, has to deal with this mapping problem. It's not optional. You can't just reverse engineer the brain and be done. You've got to tell me how consciousness maps onto there and why it does. Um, and so it's no objection that the panpsychists are just engaging with only one part of that problem, because everyone's going to have to do that. Okay. Um, and I think it's actually also legitimate to say that the, these more scientific accounts aren't really engaging with the more explanatory aspect of this problem. What they generally are doing are just telling us about the correlations. Um, maybe they can convert that into an explanatory theory just by saying some more stuff, but uh, I would say that's, um, that's where we're at with this. Okay, so, um, so I'm a little bit lost track of what time we started, so I don't know how much time I have left. We never started about 12, 15, is that right? 12, 10? Okay, so more, a bit more time. Um, Okay, so um, that's why I think um, there's this philosophical component to the project. Um, and that's why I think different theories don't necessarily have to make empirical predictions. 
Um, but of course, this does raise the question, well, what would it look like to solve this mapping problem? Um, um, especially since we can't necessarily do it by generating testable predictions. Uh, well, I think there's a fairly straightforward answer to, what well, straightforward ish <laughs> answer to what will in the end decide between these two. And I, I should say, I think there are theoretically rigorous ways in which we can sort all this out. So I'm a kind of optimist about the whole project. I think we can um, explain consciousness in the end. Um, the point is that we have to bring in what we're just going to call the subjective fact about experience itself. That's what these different theories will also disagree about. Um, so we need something like the idea of subjective data here. That is, facts about consciousness itself that a good theory of consciousness needs to explain. Um, and here, I think it's helpful to distinguish two um, sides of the subjective data. So first of all, we've got um, what I would call um, paradigm cases. So these are just clear cases of conscious experiences that we can be pretty sure are occurring. Um, for example, because subjects are very confident that they're occurring. Um, so the whole part of this that I'm not really being able to get into today is like how we actually tell <laughs> what experiences are occurring with people. Um, that is a site of a lot of theoretical problems here. But most people agree that at least in some cases we can be confident that someone is, for example, seeing something just because it's in very clear view for them and they will tell you that they're very confident that they're having an experience of it right now. So that's what I'm going to call the paradigm. Um, when it gets difficult is understanding how or whether there can be non-paradigm uh, examples of experiences, for example, experiences uh, that are unattended or in peripheral vision and so on. Um, secondly, we've got what I'll call general features, like just general properties of experience, um, the, the kinds of things that we want our theory in the end to account for. Um, and it's here that uh, it's here where we have all these features that lead people to sort of say things like, oh, it's just impossible to explain consciousness in physical terms. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to get in, into this today, but to my mind, a lot of the philosophical work here goes into um, unpacking what exactly these alleged features of consciousness are and trying to sort of give an account of how one might in the end uh, explain them in physical terms. Um, but some of the things that paradigmatically uh, are supposed to be true, say visual awareness, are things like it being externally directed or presentational. That means that when you open your eyes and have a visual experience, it's like the environment is presented to you. Like it seems to you like there's objects and events and so on that you can pay attention to. Um, secondly, that it's a guide to uh, you know, perceptual judgment. So for example, um, you, know, you can look in the environment and then make judgments about uh, what's around you. And, it's also a guide to introspection, so you can um, make, make judgments about what's going on in your own mind based on having experiences. Um, uh, experiences are the kinds of things that can be assessed for accuracy. Um, so you can talk about whether someone's hallucinating or having an illusion uh, and so on and so forth. So we better have an account where it's the kind of thing that could have that problem. Um, in some way, they are subjective or qualitative. Um, that's very, that one is very difficult to uh, unpack, but it's also a strong intuition that people have. It's like, um, there's something, uh, that's the thing that makes it seem somehow specially different from the sort of thing that one would look at, um, that's the sort of thing one gets in the physical description of neural activity. Um, it seems to be self illuminating by that. I mean, that it just seems like when you have a conscious experience, you're sort of in some sense automatically aware of it. It's sort of like, you, you just know about it by having it in some sense. Um, that's another one that's like notoriously problematic and hard to get work on, but also one that we want to um, theorize about. Uh, it's unified, that is, that uh, in some sense it feels like we have a single kind of conscious field at a given time, um, with different parts that sort of in some way form a global experience. Um, again, that's another one that's quite hard to get a grip on, but ultimately we, we do want to theorize. Um, and finally, it's also worth <laughs> mentioning that. One thing that seems to be distinctive about experience is that it gives people these intuitions that is very hard to explain. <laughs> so you might think that a good theory would explain why people have these intuitions that I think it's much better. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, yeah, five minutes. Okay, let me just, okay, so let me just um, quickly try and tie this up. Um, so the last thing I just wanted to mention then is um, in the existing literature, um, 
There are different kinds of ideas about how one might incorporate this kind of subjective evidence into a theory uh, uh, and use that as a criterion for deciding between theories. Um, and one approach that's had a lot of discussion recently under the context of the so-called integrated information theory is a so-called axiomatic approach um, associated with uh, Snowy and Koch. And their idea is that you, you start with it, uh, subjective data in the sense of just obvious axioms that um, uh, anyone who has experiences just could not doubt. And then you refine these into more precise claims that they call postulates. And then you just directly derive a theory of consciousness from those postulates. So in this case, they think that there's this thing called integrated information that is the signature of consciousness. And then you can maybe get some further vindication of your theory through the empirical testing. So that's one model. Um, I guess I'm not going to have time to actually get much into this. Um, but I guess what I'm going to say is that I, I'm not a fan <laughs> of this way of approaching. Um, so some problems that come up with IIT are the following, that um, it's requiring that the subjective data be absolutely axiomatic. It generally leads to this problem that you just end up with claims that uh, are either just too trivial to actually provide too much of a constraint. Um, or also which um, don't actually encode everything that we want to encode about uh, the experience itself. Um, and, and some other problems as well, which we're going to talk about. Um, so I think it's much better to um, think of this in terms of um, uh, what I would call an equilibrium approach. And that is that we have these sort of ordinary common sense claims about experience that we start off with, but they're not like totally self-evident and then they can be revised as we go along. Um, and also they often are quite hard to interpret. So way, the way that we actually precisify them and interpret them it is also up for debate and is revivable as we go along and like we understand more about how the brain actually works. Um, and a good theory of consciousness also should um, explain why we have these um, ideas about our own minds and should be able to explain how it is that these intuitive judgments actually track real features of experience. So, for example, everyone has this intuition that when they have a visual experience in some way, the environment around them is just presented to them for them to, to attend to. So you'd want your theory of experience to give a neural correlate that would predict that people would have that sense that the environment is just right there for them to pay attention to. Um, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't predict that, then it doesn't seem like a very good theory. Um, and and interest, interestingly, you know, that might seem like quite a minimal thing to expect from a theory of consciousness, but I actually don't think that all the theories that people take seriously these days meet that requirement. Um, in particular, one of the reasons why I'm highly skeptical about integrated information theory is that it's not at all obvious how it actually just manages to explain these basic things. Um, what it says is that you get conscious awareness when you have a special property of um, um, irreducible self-information, a kind of information theoretic property that belongs to um, a brain network. Um, but it doesn't actually explain why, if you have that property in a brain network, you know, it would seem to the subject like they're confronted with the environment or they'd be able to report to the environment or just the ordinary things that belong to experience. So for that reason, I think it's a bad theory. Whereas other theories are tailor-made to try to at least make some progress in making those types of predictions about the way experience seems. Um, and I think that is a much more promising way to um, proceed. Okay, so I think I've run out of time, so I'm just gonna stop there, so thank you. Um, yeah, let me just zoom back into that. Um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by my fourth point. Oh, um, oh, I see. Like, um, we were just talking about the motivation for panpsychism. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, they've got this idea that um, you can only explain how subjective experience is grounded on at the fundamental physical level if there's already something a bit like experience there at the bottom. Um, and I guess I just, well, I don't think that's true. And also I just, I, 
part of the problem is that I'm not sure if I even find that intelligible. So, so uh, um, part of what they're claiming is that, you know, if you look at something like an electron, that it could have a primitive kind of awareness in some sense. Um, um, it's not so much that I think that's just kind of bad because it's empirically untestable. I think it might be bad because I'm studying on sound and what that means. My grip on conscious awareness comes from just the ordinary things that I believe about it. Like it's the, like, you know, it has a, um, a certain kind of structure and it tells me about my environment and so on. Um, I'm not sure I've got a grip on how an electron could have something that meets that kind of description. Because they'll claim that they do, but <laughs> it's also not clear uh, what form this explanation would take. So even if we grant that it's intelligible, that an electron can have some kind of awareness, it's not at all clear how sort of injecting all of these little bits of all these individual consciousnesses down there at the bottom could actually sort of collectively create a kind of explanation of a unified human experience. I think that's the so-called combination problem. I'm also highly skeptical about whether they can say something sensible about that. So that. That, I think those are the kinds, kinds of objections one ought to make. <laughs> not that it's not empirically testable, is my point. Yeah. Uh, well, here I think it's important to um, make this distinction between the kind of macroscopic experiences that are the sort of primary examples of experiences um, and the, this allegation that there are these so-called microscopic experiences um, so panpsychism is just the claim that these micro experiences exist and can play this special explanatory role um, but it doesn't actually make a claim about when you get the macroscopic experiences that's why it's not engaged in what we're calling the correlation project um, so you can just you can just combine it with any other theory of that you can, so you could combine it with iit um, and say, um, by the way, whenever there's integrated information, you've got like a macro experience. Um, that's, I mean, IIT, it, what's confusing here partly is that IIT tends to itself predict a form of panpsychism of a different kind, because it says that any system that has integrated information is going to have a conscious experience, and that can include like incredibly simple systems with just a few particles. Um, but that's a different kind, it's important that that's a different kind of panpsychism, actually. Um, that's a claim that what I'm calling macroscopic experiences are much more widespread than we're um, Yeah, I mean, my complaint about AIT again is that it just doesn't explain just the ordinary subjective data, like experiences are the kind of things that people can report. <laughs> that sort of thing. Until they can just tell us why, uh, you know, how, to, how it just uh, deals with those basic criteria for a good theory of consciousness, then I'm just like, you know, I'm not that receptive. We have time. Okay, thanks everyone.